And let me uh, also mute all. And uh, as always, if you have a question or a comment, feel free to interrupt at any time, unmute yourselves, uh, ask a question or wave your hand furiously to get my attention, <laughs> uh, whatever works for you. So, um, so Jews in the News usually talks about current events from a Jewish perspective. And I uh, don't usually talk about um, theological issues, but um, a, uh, a, a, a a notable uh, Jew, uh, a colleague of uh, my parent, my father and me from the Rabbinical Assembly, the Organization of Conservative Rabbis, uh, passed away on Friday. Uh, Rabbi Harold Kushner, uh, may he rest in peace. Uh, his funeral is today at one o'clock. And I um, thought that I wanted to share a, a little bit about um, uh, Rabbi Kushner's theology as uh, based on his book, When Bad Things Happen to Good People, which made him a sensation. And as he uh, wrote in uh, the preface to this 20th anniversary edition of his book, he said, uh, if uh, if I could get my, if my son could, um, could come back to life, then uh, I would give away all fame, anything that happened as a result of this book. Um, so um, Rabbi Howard Kushner uh, was 88 years old. He uh, served uh, as a pulpit rabbi for the for the most of his career uh, in a conservative synagogue in Natick, Massachusetts, which is a suburb of Boston. And um, two children, uh, and his uh, when his younger daughter turned three, uh, the next day. He found out that his older son, Aaron, uh, was diagnosed with this rare fatal disease called progeria, a disease that uh, is an aging disease, which um, um, no one survives beyond their teen years, and uh, the body uh, ages uh, infinitely uh, quicker uh, and abnormally than usual, and uh, just there is no no cure for it. Um, so the the worst kind of torture a parent can go through is watching a death of a child, especially when they can't do anything to help their child. So there there is nothing <clears throat> nothing worse than that that I can imagine. And um, so for eleven years. Um, he and his wife and his daughter had to watch uh, their son and brother uh, wither away. Um, as a result, he was still working as a uh, congregational rabbi, which uh, leads to challenges of its own. How can you be a source of comfort <clears throat> and um, and Jewish inspiration to your congregation when you are uh, dealing with uh, such tremendous tragedy. Um, and uh, also, um, how can you uh, still be a rabbi when your faith is tested? So um, four years after his son died, his son died in 1977, um, four years later, this book was published. So, um, and uh, it, it uh, promoted him um, to, uh, to, to notoriety and fame uh, in North America, around the world. It, the book has sold 4 million copies and it has provided uh, comfort and inspiration to uh, not just to Jews, but to people of all religions and also to, uh, to other rabbis. So uh, uh, I I can uh, uh, I I can say that uh, that this book really uh, is the source of my theology, and uh, it provides um, 
uh, uh, the reason why I believe in God in, in a, in a uh, legitimate Jewish way to, uh, to answer life's most difficult question, when, uh, how do we respond when bad things happen to good people? So I, I wanted to spend uh, time today to explain his theology, uh, to uh, point out how different it is from traditional Jewish theolog theology, and why uh, it can it why it it serves as the source of my theology today. So, when we talk about a Jewish approach to God, um, well, let's say it this way: we, we believe in God in order to uh, provide us a sense of meaning and purpose in life. We believe in God to provide us with answers to uh to que to uh difficult questions to provide a source of comfort and strength in time of crisis and tragedy right so so we both so a it's not just important to under to understand how we believe in god but that belief in god will then guide us through life's challenges and help us appreciate blessing and help us endure curse and crisis okay so so though some theologians might just spend time on understanding what god is uh true theology will then extend that to answer all the other questions, okay? So, so we use Jewish theology to answer the question of e good and evil, okay? So, the, so good and evil and an understanding of God go hand in hand. And the two together help human beings navigate life, okay? There, uh, uh, there isn't one theology that uh, answers all challenges, but there is one theology that answers most, and that's the theology that you and I and all people try to come up with to that guides us most of the time and works most of the time. Uh, as a rabbi, and uh, I have uh, witnessed tragedy more often than usual, right? The average person, uh, uh, please God, does not endure tragedy too often in life, but a, a congregational rabbi experiences tragedy often, um, and I have to uh, be uh, a source of comfort and strength to people as they endure uh, these great challenges in life. And because of that, I need to have a strong base from which I can then um, feel comfortable myself and then um, provide the pastoral comfort that people need. Okay, so um, my five years as a rabbi in Massachusetts saw the usual amount of tragedy, but nothing uh, unusual about it. In other words, people died and people died at a good old age, right? The very first funeral I ever did as a congregational rabbi was a woman in her 90s who died in her sleep. That's the way I think we all kind of hope the end will come peacefully in our sleep. Um, and so it wasn't until I became the rabbi here at Sharai Tefillah that I was faced with uh, unimaginable tragedies um, over the course of the first year and a half. Uh, and I've been through that many times, but the uh, the worst of all the tragedies in my nearly 30 years was that family that was murdered uh, all in 
one day, uh, the husband and three daughters, while the wife and son were away at the beach. So those those four murders and uh, the subsequent funeral and shiva were uh, very intense times. And it is uh, this book and Rabbi Kushner's uh, approach to God and good and evil that has served me uh, over over these years. So um, a Jewish approach to God stems from how God is presented in the Bible, right? So in other words, J Judaism doesn't make up a concept of God. It understands God from the sacred text of our tradition, which is the Torah and also the rest of the Bible. So J Jewish theology stems from how, how God presents God's self in the Bible. And I'll get, to, I'll get to an explanation of that in a moment. But first, God, as presented in the Bible, is the creator of the world. The, the, there is a question about whether God is the creator of the universe. In the Torah, it's it's earth. God creates the earth. So God exists before earth is created. And God uh, causes everything to come into being. So God is the creator. God is all powerful. God brings the flood in Noah's time. Uh, and um, so God is all powerful. God is also all knowing. God knows what is uh, in Adam and Eve's heart. God knows what is in Noah's heart. God knows what is in Abraham's heart, et cetera, et cetera. So God is all-knowing, all-present, uh, uh, all-powerful, right? So, so the Torah and the Bible present God in that way. God, God causes everything to... God created everything, and not only did God... Uh, put everything into motion. God also intervenes when God wants to into the everyday life of uh, the world. So God intervenes in Noah and his family's life to uh, tell him to build an ark and to bring the flood. God intervenes in Abraham and Sarah's life and tells them to go to the land of Israel. God intervenes in Egypt and brings the plagues and, uh, and um, prompts Moses to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt, causes the sea to part and the people to walk through, causes the water to come back and drown the Egyptians. God is on Mount Sinai giving uh, the Ten Commandments and speaking to the entire community. So God is all powerful, all knowing, all present, and is imminent. That is, is here and now with us, as opposed to transcendent above and beyond. Okay, so the Torah and the Bible present God as imminent as active in the world today, and as all-powerful, all-knowing, all-present. Okay, so that's, that is the traditional understanding. The rabbis then ask the question, oh, the Torah also says, this gets to good and evil, the Torah also says, if we follow in God's ways, uh, if we follow the covenant, right, observe the laws of the Torah, then God will bless us and the community at large. If we don't follow in God's ways, then we will be punished, will be cursed, will be punished. Okay, so God is all powerful, all knowing, intervenes in our lives. Uh, and if we follow in God's ways, God will bless us. If we don't follow in God's ways, God will punish us. 
Okay, so that's all well and good if we follow in God's ways and things work out for us. The question is what happens when bad things happen to us, when bad things happen to good people. So this is the rabbis explain, and this 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 will be the end of my tradition, the explanation of the traditional theology. The rabbis say everybody who experiences tragedy in the world uh, is in their lives. It's because they deserved it. So someone dies for the rabbis, a full life is age 70. We live beyond the age of 70. It's extra. Uh, so we, we're living extra time. And but if we if someone dies before the age of 70, well, they must have done something wrong. That's how the rabbis explain it, because that's what the Torah says. God will bless us if we follow in God's ways. God will punish us if we neglect God's ways. And these, these could be little things that we do wrong or big things that we do wrong. It's all piled in a scale. You have to imagine the old-fashioned scale that uh, there are two pans with a bar connecting these two pans hanging down by a chain, and they have to, and you put weights on either side to make it equal equal balance, right? So one side will outweigh the other side, and you hope that the blessing side outweigh outweighs the curse side, right? So you you we all throughout our life add to our own balance. It's 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 uh, picturing a ledger in front of us. You know, some uh, that we add things, we take things away from the ledger. We add things to the balance. We take things away, or we add things to the other side of the balance. Every little thing counts on both sides, and it will impact what happens in our life. That's that's according to the rabbis. We can. Uh, overcome some of the bad things on the other side by repenting, right? If we take Yom Kippur seriously and the 10 days of repentance, if we ask forgiveness of our fellow human being throughout the year, then that goes to our favor. Uh, and if we pray to God sincerely, then God may have mercy on us as well. But if not, if death comes, we suffer from illness, uh, whatever it is, well, we deserve it. Or choice number two, if we kind of examine our ways and we can't figure out why we would be afflicted with such challenges, the rabbis say, well, it must be because you're righteous and God afflicts the righteous because God knows that the righteous can handle it. Okay, it's called in Hebrew, Yisurim Shel Ahava, love torture. The right, more righteous we are, the more we can handle suffering. Because if bad people were to suffer, then they would totally lose faith in God. The righteous people will never lose faith in God, so God can test the righteous. Uh, the primary example of that from the Bible is Job. Okay, so good. why do good and evil happen then, according to the rabbis, the traditional explanation, uh, because either we deserve it or because we are so righteous that we can handle it. Okay, so there are obvious challenges to this traditional theology. If everything goes well in our life and we have minor afflictions, you know, a bad knee and you need a knee replacement or minor heart issues, blood pressure. Okay, we can handle those these things because we can endure life and that's okay. But God forbid something more serious happens when we then question, what did I do to deserve this? This traditional theology might not be comforting. Oh, what you did to deserve this is be so good. And God loves you. And God knows that you can handle this. Not sure 
that that is a comforting kind of approach to life. Okay, again, for traditional people, you uh, people can accept that. There's a fire drill going on here. So if you're hearing the beeps in the background, <laughs> you're going to hear some talking, automated talking through the system in a minute. Um, uh, so uh, I apologize for that. Traditional people in, uh, uh, accept this theology because there's no other way to understand it. This is what was taught in the Bible. This is interpreted by the rabbis. This is the Jewish traditional Jewish theology that we have to accept. After the Holocaust, the death of six million people at the hands of the Nazis, uh, people uh, started to question this traditional theology. Survivors of the Holocaust question it, uh, and others who are not even survivors, just average people wondering how do we believe in God after six million of our brothers and sisters were murdered by the Nazis. So um, the traditional theology would say either the six million deserved it or God loved them so much that their families could endure it. That is, um, uh, to me, well, uh, to Rabbi Kushner also. So there's the, there's the six million. That should be a question to everybody about traditional theology. And then there's what happens in our lives. For Rabbi Kushner, what did he deserve? What did he and his wife deserve to, uh, to endure watching their son die? Okay, so there's, there's disease, and then there's this torture of watching your child die. Okay, so because of that, uh, that prompted Rabbi Kushner to come up with this other approach. And he's not the only one to try to have a post-Holocaust theology. There are there are other kinds of approaches, but it's it's Rabbi Kushner's that is the most practical and, and the most moving and the um, and I don't want to say easy, but as opposed to uh, some other theologies, which like philosophy could be very academic and could be very difficult to follow. Um, this Rabbi Kushner puts all these ideas in a in a, <laughs> layman's terms. Okay, so. Uh, and uh, for this layman, it it was very uh, in, inspiring. Okay, so I, I'm my father's son in, in sharing puns. So I, I apologize for that too. So um, how do we believe in God? And how can we be inspired by God to uh, lead a meaningful life in the face of such tremendous tragedy? Uh, global tragedy like the Holocaust, uh, personal tragedy like this disease, progeria, and other examples that we can come up with. So point number one is that there's a basic given that we have to accept that there is a God. Okay, so God exists is a um, is a the basic underpinning that we all have to that all religious people accept, okay? So um, the belief in God is such that it guides our life with a sense of eternal meaning. We're, we're on this earth for however long we're on this earth, but we like, we want to think that our life is meant to have some purpose and that its purpose is part of a bigger picture. And theology, a belief in God, helps put life and um, what we do in this life uh, within this broader picture, okay? So I can't prove that God exists. I just know that God exists. I can't, I also can't disprove that God exists, right? So you can, uh, for someone who says God doesn't exist, I can't say you're wrong. For someone who says that God exists, I can't prove that they're right. I only know that it's right. So it's a leap of faith that people who believe in God take. Once we believe in God, then we have to understand what kind of God we're believing in. So that as Jews, 
one would think we, we have no choice but to accept the traditional approach to God. So here's the kicker. Uh, we, uh, the approach to God is from the Bible. Who wrote the Bible? If God wrote the Bible, as traditional Jews believe, traditional Orthodox Jews believe, and I'm not sure all Orthodox Jews believe this today, but traditional Orthodox Jews believe that the Torah was written by God and given to Moses at Mount Sinai. As such, then who are we to question anything written in the Torah? However, uh, it would be a lot easier to understand that the Torah is a human record of events, or better, a human response to events that the Torah describes. In that way, then, uh, we have tremendous, we have now opened up possibilities for uh, understanding God. Because if we say God wrote the Torah, then the approach to the, the how God presents God's self in the Torah is the only way to understand God in the Torah. And, you, and it's a take it or leave it kind of idea in this traditional Jewish approach to God that I just described. But if it's a human description, uh, if, if it's a human response to events described, then there are whole other possibilities of understanding God in relation to these events in our lives. So in other words, uh, I understand that the Torah and the rest of the Bible is this human response to um, events. That is, that um, it's clear to from the Torah and other books of the Bible that people understood that God existed, and they understood that God, that because of the things that happened, God must have been involved in those events. So there was a cataclysmic flood that occurred at the time of Noah. Only way to explain it for the Torah would be that God decided to do that. Why would God de decide to do that? Well, we could say maybe humanity was so evil that God decided to bring the flood. So it's a human explanation as why the flood happened. Somehow there were slaves in Egypt, and somehow Moses was able to lead the slaves out of Egypt. And the fact that, this sla that these slaves were able to overcome their masters and were able to leave and to start a new nation on their own that's miraculous. It's as if plagues were brought down, as if the waters of the sea split and then came back and drowned the pursuing army. It's as if we had heard God speak to, the, to us at Mount Sinai, and as a result of some awesome experience that took place on that mountain, we write the Torah to show that this is what we need to do every day, all the time, 365 days a year to exhibit that and show that we believe in God. So when we if we say that the Torah and the Bible are man-made, then we open up possibilities. Uh, clearly, there's a there's a challenge with that too, because then we might be saying that people created God and people created the concept of God. I can't discount that uh, critique. That critique is there. But for me, the understanding God in this way from a human perspective makes more sense. And I'm able to explain the Holocaust and progeria according to this way, and not to be angry at God in the process. Okay, so for Kushner, and for me, as, as Kushner's student, by um, accepting his theology as my theology, 
that I, I believe that God created the forces of nature and the rules of physics as we know them, and then stepped back and left and leaves it up to us to uh, complete creation and make the world as perfect as possible. There are still things that we need to do in order to make the world better. We still need to find a cure for progeria. We need still need to find a cure for cancer. We still need to have enough of a warning system when volcanoes erupt and hurricanes happen and earthquakes happen that so to reduce the amount of destruction and death. We're, we're not there yet. So there are natural things in the on earth that we aren't able to control yet. There are uh, natural things in terms of disease that we're not able to control yet and haven't cured, but we found the cure, we, or at least a vaccine for polio. We've eradicated some diseases. We, we, we found um, uh, antibiotics that can, that a uh, hundred years ago, people would die of a sinus infection, but now they won't die anymore because there are antibiotics, right? So there are many things that we have found the cures for, still things that we still need to search for. The same goes for human evil. So a uh, Hitler, we, it is in our power to prevent a Hitler from happening, right? That we can't prevent Hitler from being born but we certainly could have prevented Hitler from coming to power. We certainly could have prevented Hitler from uh, carrying out his plan to kill uh, all the Jews in Europe and eventually all the Jews in the world. It, humans evil, humans capacity to evil is something that we have the power to overcome. Okay, it's just, so <clears throat> for this theology then, the uh, you you understand things that are written in the in the Torah as a person or a group of people's perception at that particular time of what was happening and putting it in a religious perspective. Um, so the same thing we could understand. Israel just celebrated its seventy fifth birthday last week, and there's a prayer that's that is included in the services on Israel Independence Day called Al-Hanisim. There's an Al-Hanisim for the miracles prayer for Hanukkah, one for Purim, and there's one that's written for Yom Ha'atzma'ut as well, understanding that how could 600,000 Jews in the land of Israel in 1948 defeat the mighty, the seemingly mighty armies of seven Arab nations that, that attacked it on May 15th, 1948. How could they serve, how could they win a, a war or at least re reach a ceasefire a year later and still uh, have, have uh, managed to ensure that the state of Israel would exist? That, for some, you could understand that in a theological way that God uh, intervened and was there for those 600,000 Jews in Israel to defeat the mighty armies of uh, the Arab nations. You could understand it. I mean, you could explain it militarily, strategically, politically, etc. but you could, can also explain it theologically. And so that's just an example of how we understand uh, Israel's independence in light of God and, and um, putting a a God perspective on, on human events. So do I believe that God intervenes and uh, in, into my life, in my life today? You know, I go poo, poo, poo. I say, thank God, because it's just, that's just by nature what I say. I, but I don't, when, when I think about it objectively, I don't think that God personally intervenes to cure somebody or to afflict somebody else with some kind of disease. I do believe that uh, in order to, we need to find God while we are enduring crisis in order to 
help survive the crisis, that it makes it easier for us when we are in a in when we know we have a community of people supporting us and praying with us to help us endure crisis. And and doesn't mean that we're going to survive. It doesn't mean that we won't suffer, but our suffering will uh, be manageable with a, a belief in God that allows that God did not make this happen. You know, I've, I've used this theology, God forbid, when, 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 after 9-11 with uh, the family from our congregation whose um, son and husband was killed in the Pentagon that day. And um, surely the family was expressing um, horrific grief and anger at God. Why did God cause that plane to crash into the Pentagon, killing their beloved son and husband? Um, and I let the family cry and scream and be angry. But after a while said, it, it's, I don't think it will be helpful to you to keep on blaming God for this tragedy. That instead, look at all the people who are here. Look at the look at the Navy itself, and they sent this person to be with you all the time to help you through the process with uh, the naval with the paperwork and the Navy, and to be there with you as a source of comfort. Look at the your community that has come out in great numbers to support you. This is where God is found. God is not in uh, the terrorist who uh, flew the plane into the into the Pentagon. God is with the people who are doing good. So, so this is this is Kushner's theology. This is Kushner's approach to good and evil. This is an approach that that has worked for me uh, over the years. And and like I said, there's no perfect theology. You accept the traditional theology, then you have no way to explain six million, and you have no way to explain progeria. You don't accept the traditional th theology, then you questioning then who is God, what is God, but. Uh, there is way within the system to see uh, maybe there are hints of this, right? In other words, to be partner that that our job is to be partners with God to finish creation. That's what tikkun olam is all about. That Hebrew phrase to repair the world or to perfect the world depends how we translate the word tikkun um, to 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 make the world a better place. That's letakein olam de malchut shaddai. That's what the prayer Alenu says that we say three times a day at the end of the service, our job is to fix the world under the sovereignty of God in heaven. So um, uh, that's that's an example from liturgy of this idea that we are that we are trying to partner with God, a God who is out there as the creator waiting for us to uh, to be partners with God. Any any questions or comments? So uh, this isn't new. I've I've spoken about this over the years, over the high holidays, other times of the year as well, Yisker services over the years. So you've heard me uh, speak about this many times. But uh, with uh, with Rabbi Kushner's passing on Friday, I thought that it would be appropriate to uh, to teach uh, again his theology in in his memory and i i hope i hope that his daughter uh, the only uh, surviving member of the family still his wife passed away last year so i i just pray that his daughter ariel uh and her family will uh uh be comforted by all the outpouring of of love and support from the uh the, the synagogue in natick and also all of uh Rabbi Kushner's fans and readers from around the world, I'm sure people are inundating the daughter with, uh, with emails and, and letters. And I just hope that that provides a, a measure of comfort for her and the rest of the family. So uh, I wish everybody a good rest of the day and um, see you all next Monday for another edition of Jews and the News. Take care. Yashir Koach, Jonah. Yashir Koach. It was wonderful. Yeah. Right. Have a good day, everybody. Bye-bye.